OK. So question in the daily task for you to have contemplated already. Why are the astronauts on the International Space Station able to do zero G experiments? Why are they weightless? Did anybody contemplate that and come to an answer that they would care to share? I didn't get the question. Um, they're the same distance from the Earth as we are? Compared to what the Earth's radius is, the distance they are from the surface of the Earth is inconsequential. If you shrunk the entire Earth down to the size of a bowling ball, then even with Mount Everest and all of our craters, which I can't remember, Marianas Trench, our deepest crater, even with those imperfections in our surface, which we know this is very much not, the Earth isn't flat on the surface. There's mountains, there's hills. We're very aware of that here. But if the entire Earth was the size of a bowling ball, the surface of the Earth would be smoother than any bowling ball which has ever been made. So those giant mountains are nothing compared to the distance to the center of the Earth. The Earth is massive, and that's kind of hard to deal with. Thinking of things that I was going to forget to tell you, the one that I was going to forget to tell you is we're going to deal with scientific notation today. I didn't stress this as a point all by itself, and it gets really annoying to deal in scientific notation. It's where we have so many numbers away from the zero, or the end decimal in either direction. Either we've got zero point zero 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 something, or we have something zero 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 point. When you're out that far, just looking at this number that takes the entire page to write isn't practical. And all of those numbers past about the fifth one, they have no net effect. So that's when we jump into scientific notation, where we take two, three, four, maybe five numbers, and we say like 5.68 times 10 to the big number. And that big number on the 10 is how many decimals you shift over. So scientific notation in and of itself is something really simple. But if you haven't dealt with it before, it's deceptive and quirky, especially if you're not used to dealing with exponents. Outside of scientific notation, you don't run into many exponents other than squared. So it might feel uncomfortable. You might have questions about it. Make sure you ask those questions. The other thing that I'm very likely to forget to tell you, there's a career fair today over at the Bruce Pittman Center. Many of you are pretty fresh into college. Still go. It's a good experience. You will just get used to talking to potential employers. You might figure out, oh god, I would love to have this job, but I really ought to have this other major. So if you have time, it starts at 2. It's right across from the bookstore. Go over, check it out. At the very least, there's probably candy on the tables, and it's somewhere to go. Do check it out. Now, getting back to all of this, the International Space Station is, what, 4,000 miles above the surface of the Earth? I put it in miles to make sure you guys could conceptualize it. What's 4,000 miles away from us right now on the surface of the Earth? How far do you have to drive to be that far away? Well, Montana itself is about 500 miles if you go long ways across it. So Montana's right next to us. Unless you're from way out of state, you've got a decent concept of how big Montana is. Um, this neck of Idaho, where we live, if you go from Washington through Idaho to Montana, that's about 200 miles. So 4,000 miles is probably going to be a bit more than the width of the United States. So it's a chunk of space. And that's how far up to get to the International Space Station. And by the way, they whiz around us really fast. If I remember right, it's about 20 minutes for them to get all the way around the Earth. They thought it was 200 miles from the surface, 4,000 to 300. Hey, so yes, other side of the Earth. Thank you. 
reading comprehension is not my friend at the moment. So they're about 200 miles up, which means half the distance across Montana. Um, but that's not much of anything compared to how big the Earth is, which I don't have on here. But anyways, they feel a fair chunk of the Earth's gravitational force at that point. But they do zero-g experiments. Go ahead. Isn't it because they're in free fall around the Earth? They're in free fall. They are the same as that vomit comet going up and down and up and down. But they are moving. We talked projectile motion. You've got a velocity in this direction that's constant, and you've got an acceleration in this direction that's constant. Well, their velocity is so good that in the time it takes them to fall down five miles, the surface of the Earth has curved five miles. So they're going so fast that the distance they fall matches the distance that the Earth curves away from them. That's what an orbit is. An orbit is a special way of falling and not hitting the ground. So they still have full gravity on them, but since everything is falling, everything is accelerating at the same frame, gravity doesn't enforce weight on them. And so they are weightless. They are in at zero G. But it's because they're falling. Now, does anybody have questions in general about the whole task? So you're all experts on relativity, and I can put that on this first test. <laughs> the relativity stuff we will get to later. But it's nice to have some time to think about early on. So we'll start on a nice, simple binary. The Andromeda Galaxy, 2.5 million light years away from us. A light year means the distance light can travel within one year. So if we get a telescope which has such phenomenal resolution, we can actually see the surface of a planet in the Andromeda Galaxy from right here. We are looking back in time, two and a half million years. Because when you look with a telescope, you are looking at light that is here, right now. But it takes two and a half million years for light to get from them to us. So there are stars in the Andromeda galaxy which died a million years ago. And we can still look at for another million and a half years. Because their light won't stop coming to us because they died. It already made that light and sent it out. So does this thing, two and a half million years in our past, exert a force on you? Good job. Yes, it does. Does something on the absolute opposite side of the universe from us exert a force on you? personally. OK, so let's turn that around. Are you currently pulling objects from the other side of the universe to the Earth? OK, good job. Great work, everybody. I think that's a fantastic job for today, dragging things across the entire universe. Don't exert yourself too much. Everything in the universe is pulling on everything else. And that is the only reason that gravity matters as a force, because there is no opposite to it. Now, magnetically, are you attracting things on the opposite side of the universe? That's one of the other forces we have. But because magnetism comes in poles, there's norths and souths, and they come in balanced sets, the magnetic force doesn't reach out very far. Because if you zoom far enough away, you're looking at a big ball of balanced net magnetic force. But as you zoom further and further away, your envelope of thing you're looking at has more and more mass. 
mass continues to add greater and greater force all the time. So the gravitational force on you from the Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared pulling you down, which part of the Earth is doing that to you? Which one grain of sand can you pluck out from somewhere in the core of the Earth and say, here it is, this is what I'm attracted to? It's every individual proton and electron that makes up the entire Earth pulling on you. So the desk over there is pulling you all that way. Most of the pull that way is balanced by part of the wall over there pulling you that way. All of the Earth below you, there is a column of Earth straight down just below you that is pulling you straight down. But everything else is pulling you down and to a side. But since the Earth is this nice big sphere, the amount of stuff on your right is about the same as the amount of stuff on your left. So those pulls to your right and left cancel and you don't feel anything. But each individual pull is the pull on each individual atom of you by each individual atom of the planet. And all of those add together because they are all pulls. There are no balancing pushes. So you don't have an electric force pulling you to the Earth because there's just as many electrons as protons. And so all of those pulls and pushes balance out. Gravity itself is insanely weak. Now, thinking of where the Earth is pulling on you, do we know that there is a center of the Earth? If the Earth is this giant hollow sphere, if it's this lovely candy shell, and if we drill too far for oil, oops, we pop through, and then there's beach ball on the other side, we just deflated the Earth, oh God. If it was hollow, but the same mass. <coughs> so now there's a ton of mass immediately under your feet for just this little itty bitty space. Would you notice? Fairly easy question, it's mostly looking at a trick question. We're looking at the center of mass. As long as the center of mass is unchanged, the general effect is unchanged. If you're far enough away that the center of mass is essentially the same as everything else. Now as far as gravity itself goes, I'm going to pass around a worksheet if there's not questions and everything else that slow us down. And I'm going to have you guys do some problems using universal gravity which is the F equals G M M over D squared or R squared or whatever you want to make it. The mass of the two objects proportional to the force. The distance between them inverse squared proportionality. The big thing for you to know going forward into exams is just that proportionality and inverse square proportionality. But I want you to play with the actual values. So you will calculate how much force the Earth exerts on the moon, as well as how much force you exert on the person sitting next to you. Well, for most of you, you're not sitting a meter apart from each other. I used round numbers. To see how much gravitational force there is between you and another person. That's right, you're attracted to everybody, gravitationally speaking. But one thing that I didn't put in on your task at all, that this is the only day we really get to talk about, is orbits. So I'm going to spend a lot of time doing mostly standard lecture on orbits. So this is my last regular question for a little while today. So you go outside right now. You sit still in one spot on the grass for 24 hours. Actually, let's make it a whole month. You keep looking at the moon. When do you see it?
if I actually knew what phase the moon was in right now, I probably should have asked specifically for today's moon. It's the moon. This is an easy enough one to answer. Okay. So, the at night crowd is struggling and waning. It's the moon. We see the moon at night. Everybody knows that. You see it during the day and you're like, oh, holy cow, I can see the moon. That's awesome. So it's semi-reasonable to think, well, you can see it all the time. If I'm talking from anywhere on Earth, then see it all the time is absolutely the right answer. Someone somewhere on the Earth can see the moon at any point in time. But for you, specifically in one location, you can see the moon for half the day. And I had said last time that I was going to start putting timers on these, and I forgot that until right now. Yell at me when I give a question that doesn't have a timer built in. I need to get in the habit of having a timer so you know when submissions are going to close out. Now, well, let's make that. All right, I'm going to make this one as homework, but it's not actually going to be graded or anything. I'm going to disable it after this and delete it or something or change it and make it review. This was just my way of getting a slide out here right now so that I could talk about some things about how orbits work. This is how most people will draw an orbit if asked. Show me an orbit. They'll draw a circle. But orbits are not circular, except in incredibly rare cases. An orbit will be an ellipse, which means it has two points that it rotates around. It gets close to the center of mass and it gets far away from the center of mass. And that one of the videos in your whole assignment talked about how this works and that it's moving really fast here and it's moving really slow here. Other way around. Anyways, it sweeps an even area at a time. That's Kepler's law, which we're not going to hit at all. But most orbits look like this, as an ellipse. And so if we combine the orbit of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, this is going back to using circles just so we can see it easily. But this wiggly path would be the orbit of the Moon around the Sun. Because the Moon is going around the Earth while the Earth is going around the Sun. And further, how many times does the Earth go, Moon go around the Earth for the Earth going around the Sun one time? Does anybody think they know a number for that? How long is the cycle of the Moon? How long from full Moon to full Moon? 28 days. 28 days, about a month. How long does it take the Earth to get around the Sun? One year. That's the definition of a year. So how many months in a year? So how many times should the moon go around the Earth for the Earth going around the sun one time? Because it's 28 and 365 and not 12 and 1, it works out to being about 13 cycles-ish. But for this, they just wanted you know, lines to cross into each other. So it runs out to 13 orbits and comes as accurate as you're going to find. So it takes the moon 28 days to go all the way around the Earth. It takes the Earth one year to go all the way around the sun. Both of those work out. Moon goes around the Earth 12, 13-ish times. Now, here's a question. OK, how do you define what a day is on the Earth? 24 hours. Well, not 24 hours. Physically, what happens to make a day? Sun rises and sets. That's what we see. If we're zoomed out this level, what happened to the Earth in that time? It 
rotated around its axis all the way around one time, which caused the sun to hit every section of the Earth evenly. So one day is one time turning all the way around. Now that's a Earth day is 24 hours. How long is a moon day? Think about it. See if you know. Most of you probably do know the key elements you need to know this, but you don't know that you know it. So I want you to think for a little while. Try to figure it out on your own with what you know about the moon. Go ahead and chatter with your neighbors. Okay, is anyone willing to venture a guess? How long is a day on the moon? If you're sitting on the moon, how long does it take from sun up to next sun up? And this isn't actually gonna help you right here. Okay, we got 12 hours. Higher, lower? Okay, we've got uh, half a month. Higher, lower? All right, we're starting to get some split. All right, raise your hand for higher and for lower. All right, so it looks like we're going towards higher, so more than half a month. You got to say something. How much more? Just under a month. Just under a month. Anyone else? Okay, higher, lower. Okay, now you're on the spot. Nobody outbid you. Why just under a month? Why 28 days? Um, education, yeah. Okay, what part of your education? <laughs> Back in the day, I heard it was around a month, and 28 days is what we just talked about. It's an oddly specific number. What did we just talk about 28 days for? The phases of the moon? But a phase of the moon is how long it takes the moon to go around the Earth. So the Earth is the sun of the moon? How is that also how much sun it gets? Twenty-eight days is right. It's an odd coincidence. The time it takes the moon to get around the Earth is exactly the same amount of time it takes the moon to turn around on its own axis. This is why, here's the piece you knew but probably didn't know was relevant, we have the old man in the moon. Have you guys ever heard of the old man in the moon? That if you look up there, there's a face that you've never personally been able to see? Or have you heard about the dark side of the moon? Does the dark side of the moon mean that side of the moon that never gets sun? If there's one side of the moon that never gets sun, that would mean it doesn't have days and nights. It just has the bright side and the dark side. So the moon is the force, we're done. The dark side of the moon is that side of the moon we on Earth never get to see. It's where that alien base is because we, just, we can never see over there so it's got to be a conspiracy someone's hiding it from us because the moon spins on its own axis at the same speed it goes around the earth as it's spinning it's keeping that one face pointed at us all the time because those two matched in duration 
And so we have one side of the moon always facing us. Now, as for what is actually illuminated on the moon, the moon is always Curses. I don't have zoom it running. OK. The moon is always lit halfway. The half that is facing the sun over here is always illuminated. It's just a question of how much from on Earth we can see. So new moon, what does that mean? What phase of the moon is the new moon? The new moon is when there's no light coming from the moon. So it's completely dark before even this. So we're only seeing the side of it that has no sun. What time of the day is the moon out during a new moon? When is moon rise in comparison to sunrise? Dusk, so when the sun goes down, the moon comes up. So blue half of the, sun, of the Earth is what's seeing the sun. The sun is over there. So as the Earth goes around, here the Earth is rotating in. You're just starting to see the sun. So this is morning. Here is night. You're just sitting right here. You're losing sight of the sun, and you're moving around to the other side. So right here. You're losing sight over here, and you're gaining sight over here. So you're just starting to get sight of this. How much of the illuminated portion of this one can we see? You can see all of it, because the sun's coming in from behind you and striking it. Whereas if the moon's over here, the sun's hitting this side of it. We're seeing this side of it. So over here, we're seeing the non-illuminated side of the moon at the same time as we're seeing the sun. So the new moon, sunrise and moonrise, are the same time. Because they're both on the same side of us, celestially speaking. So a full moon, what time does a full moon raise? Full moon, we can see the entire illuminated side. So it's over here, opposite side of the sun. So as you come around, you hit this point. Are you gaining or losing sight of the sun? Losing sight of the sun. So this is sunset. And are you gaining or losing sight of the moon? So this is moon rise. So, a full moon will be out all night long, every time. Let's change it up a little bit. Lunar eclipse. Will there ever be a lunar eclipse during a new moon? Lunar eclipse is when there's a shadow cast on the moon. The shadow is cast by 